Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Firelight Chat. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Cop City and specifically the Stop Cop City movement. Cop City is a police training facility that is intended to be built in Atlanta, Georgia. But it's also much more than that, because that is a template for such facilities being uh, built all around the country. This is not good news. And when you hear about what they are, what a cop city would mean, uh, what it represents in terms of domestic policing and the militarization of domestic policing, I think you'll be, as I am, quite horrified. Also, it's about the murder of Manuel Tortuquita Tehran, who was one of the protesters of Cop City and was murdered by Georgia police. So I'm going to introduce you to some people who are very involved with the movement to stop Cop City. Uh, before they come on, let me tell you who they are. Lev Omelchenko was born in Ukraine. He immigrated with his family to Brooklyn at age nine. As a filmmaker, he is driven by collaborations with cultural and community laborers whose practice <clears throat> is outside the traditional film industry. His films have screened throughout the country at festivals, including the Atlanta Film Festival and Maryland Film Festival, and in classrooms at universities like MIT, Columbia, and Emory. Lev is currently in production on a documentary feature film about the protest movement to stop Cop City in Atlanta. As a director of photography, Lev filmed the Cop City video journalism piece for AJ+, which recently won an Emmy Award. We also have Nolan Huber Rhodes. He is an Emmy Award winning director, cinematographer, and video journalist who focuses on stories of resistance and liberation movements, particularly in the US South. He is a PhD candidate who has spent the last five years studying narrative paradigm theory and asking questions about how we can use film, psychology, and social science to disrupt oppression and tell paradigm shifting stories. His work has been featured in Al Jazeera, Democracy Now!, The New Yorker, Rolling Stone, and NPR. Nolan is in production on a documentary film about the activist struggle to stop Cop City in Atlanta. Of course, that would be his work with Lev. Also, Kiana Jones is with us. She is a political and social justice advocate and community organizer who is a staunch advocate for quality, affordable child care and equity in education. She currently works with community movement builders to educate, engage, and empower the Black community in Atlanta, Georgia. She is an ordained minister and proprietor of E equals MC Squared Educational Services, LLC, where she works as a homeschool curriculum consultant, IEP advocate, and German translator. She's a wife and a mother of five unique and extraordinary children. And finally, what an honor this is. Tortiquita's mother is with us, Belkis Tehran, referred to as the mother of the movement. Tehran's second child, Manuel Tortiquita Esteban Paez Tehran, was killed by Georgia State Patrol during a multi-department raid of the South River Forest on January 18th of this year. Since January, she has made numerous trips up from Panama to Atlanta to join the activists fighting to stop Cop City from being built. She fields her master's degree in divinity, specializing in urban ministries, alongside being steeped in liberation theology, has prepared her for the role she has taken on. Here is the story of Cop City. Here is the story of Tortiquita. Here is the story of resistance to Cop City. And obviously, I'm not very neutral on this. I hope that having heard what you were about to hear, that you too will feel moved to be active, to hold the story in your own consciousness, and to do what you can to further the movement to stop it. Here is our firelight chat. So to all of you, thank you so much for being uh, my guest here today, Belkis, particularly to you. Thank you. I, um, I know that I speak for so many. Uh, my deepest condolences and a real honor that you would join us here today. You're such an inspiration to so many of us. Uh, your leadership so important and to have taken your own grief, uh, using it for the kind of purposes that you are. It's deeply inspiring. Thank you. To all of you, I'm so uh, not only grateful to you for being here, but um, very inspired. Uh, I have been from the beginning 
uh, very aware of the story of Cop City. I do see it as a template for a police state in the United States. So I see it as a bigger story, even than just what's happening in Atlanta. And um, I'm really impressed uh, by those of you. And I know you know that this is a national story, probably an international story at this point. Uh, people all over the world uh, recognizing uh, your courage, what you're doing on the front lines. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, some people who are watching might not be aware of the history, how all this happened, what it really is. They might have heard the phrase Cop City, they might have heard of Tortuquita, but they don't really know. So if we could begin with you, Reverend Jones, can you give us a little just background? What's going on here? What is Cop City and how did all this begin? Thank you so much, Marianne, for having us. Cop City is billed as a state-of-the-art public safety training facility in the city of Atlanta. But what Cop City really is, is a militarized police training facility that would come complete with a mock city for training in urban warfare. It would come with a burn tower where they could practice burning down homes and other buildings. It would also, in its first iteration, it would have included a Black Hawk helicopter landing pad, as well as a bomb testing facility. At this point, they have downgraded the scale of the bomb testing facility, but there would be an upgraded firing range, which would be more than double the size of the existing firing range that's there. It would also be complete with the SWAT training facility right across the street. This is 85 acres spread out across the 381 acres South River Forest. Now, when people hear 85 acres, they think, okay, if it's 381 acres, 85 out of 381, hmm, that's not so bad. But what people don't understand is that those are not 85 contiguous acres lumped together. That's 85 acres spread out. That's actually gonna be more than 200 acres as being used. And the plans for Cop City in total account for 380 out of those 381 acres of forest land. So you're coming into Southeast Atlanta, which is also unincorporated DeKalb County, where the city of Atlanta should honestly have no jurisdiction, but you're going to cut down the largest urban forest in the southeastern United States, 381 acres of trees mm -hmm. that encompasses the South River, which is also the headwater of the largest waterway in the state of Georgia, a very important watershed here in Southeast Atlanta and DeKalb County. And you have this area of black people where you want to take their green space away. You want to continue to pollute their water and you want military training for local police officers and officers from around the world. So Cop City is not just a state of the art public safety training facility. It really is a center for urban warfare here in the city of Atlanta. When did all this begin? When did the plans for uh, Cop City begin? And why do you think they began with Atlanta? Well, I will say that the plans for Cop City certainly didn't begin in Atlanta because there are Cop Cities all over the nation that all sprang up after 2020. And mm. in the year 2020, we saw so much in this country when it came to the murder of civilians by police officers. You had the murder of George Floyd, the murder of Breonna Taylor. Here in the city of Atlanta, we had the murder of Rayshard Brooks, but that was also on the heels of so many other police murders here in the city of Atlanta. But in 2020 across the nation, people stood up. They stood up against militarized policing. They stood up against police officers being able to murder with impunity and not being punished. They stood up to say, we're not going to take this anymore because we know that this is not right. Even if you are a, per a person who believes in policing, this is not what it should look like. So the idea of Cop City began brewing after local government saw that people were really, really restless with the current state of affairs at that time. And what they saw was that people were exercising their First Amendment right to protest, and they were expressing dissent in ways that these local governments had not seen before. So in the city of Atlanta, it all began with a wealthy neighborhood that we know as Buckhead 
really getting nervous and saying, hey, they're protesting, but we don't want them coming to Buckhead. You guys have to do something about this. And if you don't do something about this, then we are going to take our 40% tax revenue from the city of Atlanta and we are going to secede. So after the local government and the state government here in the city of Atlanta saw <laughs> that people were rising up rising up against fascism, because essentially that's what it is when you tell people that they can't disagree with you. When you tell people that they are now terrorists simply because they speak out against something that the government wants, that's called fascism. And because people wanted to stand up against that, we had one council member in the city of Atlanta who was named Joyce Shepard, who introduced the bill, the ordinance for Cop City. And what Cop City was, honestly, was the compromise with the city of Atlanta and the neighborhood of Buckhead in order to keep Buckhead with the city of Atlanta so that we could keep their tax dollars. The city of Atlanta City Council was willing to sell out the rest of Atlanta just because Buckhead didn't want undesirables coming into their wealthy area and they wanted to be able to maintain the status quo here in Atlanta. You know, it's interesting, when I was a child, there was a sense that people who were in the military were fighting wars and people who were domestic police officers were not fighting wars, the quote unquote peacekeepers. And I know that that was never totally true for every neighborhood in the United States, don't get me wrong. But in general, the social consensus was that that's what it should have been. So are you saying that this whole trend towards the military militarization of the police basically began after 9-11? I will say that it did. I mean, honestly, after 9-11, you had the introduction of the Patriot Act, mm -hmm. which really gave the government leeway to treat American citizens as terrorists. Yeah. After 9-11, you began to see so many instances where local police mm -hmm. departments have become militarized. I right. mean, just in Georgia alone after 2020, actually during 2020, Georgia received more than 2,700 individual pieces of military equipment. Well, a lot of that, of course, has to do with the fact that the with the increase in the um, defense budget, the Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Boeing will say, hey, you need this new yes. equipment. And the military will say, well, we have the, the one that's two years old. No, you need the new one. What should we do with the old one? And they would say, send it to the boys back home. Yes. You see uh, domestic police now with gear that you uh -huh. never see when I was a child. Yes, my involvement in the movement to stop Cop City you know, has been um, plenteous and, and I've done various things here within the movement. Most recently though, um, I have worked with the Faith Coalition to Stop Cop City. I do work with community movement builders um, in my day job. I am a community organizer with community movement builders and we are one of the many organizations that is committed to defending the Atlanta forest. A lot of what I do revolves around educating people about what Cop City really is, about how the people of the city of Atlanta and unincorporated DeKalb County have been disenfranchised in the process because a lot of people don't know that this entire process has been illegal and convoluted from the beginning. A lot of people would say, well, you know, the, the neighborhood, they must want it because why would they push this through? Many people don't understand that people in the city of Atlanta showed up on various occasions giving more than 15 hours of public comment. I mean, the first meeting where they introduced the ordinance for Cop City, people found out at the last <clears throat> minute and it was via Zoom, but people gave 17 hours of public comment against the facility. We've also shown up more recently in person where we've given 12 and 15 hours, 17, again, 19 hours of public comment to say that we don't want this facility. And these days, what we are doing is since the city council has decided to push through an ordinance to continue to fund this project, even though the price tag has more than doubled, doubled in taxpayer dollars, by the way, despite the fact that the city of Atlanta city council has said, we're still gonna push this through, even though people don't want it. And even though it's gonna bleed our city dry, our response was to launch a petition for a ballot referendum to let the people of Atlanta decide. The people have never gotten a voice in this project from the beginning. Neither the people of the city of Atlanta nor the people of unincorporated DeKalb. What we've decided to do is go to where people are and ask them, 
do you think we should have a voice in this? And our overwhelming response has been positive. People do believe that we should be able to vote on this because this is something that's going to take more than $67 million in taxpayer funds. And of people course should have a say in that. And of course it's being funded by many major corporations which do business there as well. You know, I have felt um, in this campaign that I'm running as well as in my last one, and also if just to, you look at the polls, the problem is not the American people. The problem is that the voice of the American people is being so systematically discounted. Um, yes. We are basically a decent people, but the government now more and more ignores and just gives lip service to the idea that the will of the people is what should now be done. Nolan, yes. tell us about yourself and how you got here and what your involvement is uh, with this movement at this time. I am part of a collective of community journalists called uh, the Atlanta Community Press Collective. Uh, I do the, the video journalism and a lot of the investigative reporting. Uh, around Cop City, um, part of what we do and uh, a big part of uh, just being a part of this movement more broadly uh, has been the fact that the city of Atlanta in many ways, like many cities in the rest of the country, uh, our media systems have become corporatized. So uh, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which is the paper of record in Atlanta, is owned by Cox Industries um, or Cox Media. And uh, the CEO of Cox Media, Alex Taylor, is the uh, chair of the fund of the corporate fundraising arm for Cop City. So uh, like Kiana and you, Marianne, were talking about, um, originally the city came out and they said, uh, we are going to have, uh, we're gonna give $30 million in public funds to build Cop City. And because Cop City is actually going to be built and owned by the Atlanta Police Foundation, who is a private nonprofit entity, which is how Atlanta actually generally does most of our public, uh, anything that would typically be um, like a public resource um, is done through public private partnerships and often run by private entities. So Cop City will be run by a private entity, the Atlanta, the Atlanta Police Foundation, uh, the CEO of, of which is Dave Wilkinson. Dave Wilkinson was actually a Secret Service agent uh, during the Bush administration. So when you talk about 2001 and you talk about the precedence of uh, calling American citizens domestic terrorists, Dave Wilkinson, there's a, there's a picture if you all have seen that picture of a Secret Service agent whispering in George W. Bush's ear uh, after the attack on the Twin Towers in New York City, the person whispering in Bush's ear is Dave Wilkinson. He is the CEO of the Atlanta Police Foundation and has paid more money than any other police foundation head in the country, making over $500,000 a year. So when Dave Wilkinson and the city of Atlanta presented the plans for Cop City to the public. They said, we're going to have $30 million. This is going to cost $90 million total, but we're going to do $30 million in public funds. And then we're going to do $60 million in private funds from corporations. Uh, those corporations include Chick-fil-A, Coca-Cola, Home Depot, uh, Waffle House, uh, whose workers, by the way, are on strike right now in Columbia, South Carolina uh, for over wage theft. So after they promised uh, the money, the 30 million in public funds, 60 million in corporate funds, ACPC, our collective, began investigating uh, through open records requests, through conversations with people, through interviews. And what we found to be the case was that the city of Atlanta had actually been lying. They said that it would be $30 million in public funds, but the lease agreement that they signed with the police foundation said that it will be $30 million in a lump sum and $1 million per year for the next 30 years to help the police foundation pay off a $25 million loan that they were taking out to build Cop City. Now, why did they need a loan? We do not know this for sure. But the belief that is that they actually have struggled to raise corporate funds because the movement has been so powerfully voicing uh, their opposition to this that it looks so bad for these corporations 
to actually give the money that they had had you know potentially agreed to give in the first place. So now the bill for the public, as Kiana said, has grown from 30 million to 67 million. And this was only made public information because of working class folks who started a journalism collective and started investigating this story. And we found that the mayor, that the mayor and city council had been uh, misleading the public uh, by the way that they were talking about it. And of course, we have to keep the conversation <clears throat> away from this current trend to make everything about economics. This is morally wrong. This is about, uh, obviously, when we get to Belkis, this is about e evil. Uh, it is it is about uh, a complete transformation of what policing should be. It is about separating police from the population. It is about turning the people of the United States into an enemy. Um, and uh, I don't really care how much it costs, uh, it's too much money. If, it, if you told me we could do it for $5, I'd say still, I would wanna shut this thing down. Um, Lev, what is your involvement in all of this? Yeah, hi, thank you for having me and highlighting this issue. I'm a filmmaker. And so I found that my calling within this movement was to help tell the story of what's happening in the city and the story of this movement. I think that kind of uh, true to the center in the heart of what my film is about is really looking at what calls people into a movement like this. And I think what's really powerful and something you know I experienced firsthand is this is a truly unprecedented movement. This, is, this movement has persisted for two years now in an urban environment where people have occupied uh, public space, lived in tree houses, where people from all different walks of life, whether they're in the faith coalition, like Reverend Keanu Jones, whether they're journalists, whether they're school teachers, whether they're um, honestly just everyday working class people, uh, environmentalists, conservationists, people from very different perspectives on policing, on what they think the city should be or could be, have come together to defend this piece of land and really defend the future of the city. And so I've, I've seen it sort of as like my, you know, my opportunity to help tell the story of all of these people coming together and creating a movement that has survived really unprecedented amount of repression. You know, we're talking about domestic terrorism charges that really are the first time those kind of charges have been levied against an environmental movement. Um, we're talking about Tortuguita, who is the first climate activist to be murdered in the modern environmental age. So I, I see my role as the person who can help uh, articulate or help people who have really become really leaders and, and truly the inspiring people within this movement who are fighting the struggle to help tell their story and really highlight the degree to which what's happening here in Atlanta is truly like a century defining event. You know, when we talk about this facility being a new step in police militarization, when we talk about the repression being unlike anything we've seen, we're also seeing a mobilization of a city, of its people, of people around the country supporting that mobilization that I think has learned a lot from the 2020 movement, from Standing Rock, from the civil rights movement. All of these things are coming together in a really unique and powerful way. And I think it's that combination of things that's really allowed this movement to survive and really be, like Nolan said, actually very successful. You know, they originally wanted to build this thing over a year ago. They thought they'd be done with construction and they still haven't technically broken ground on the construction. So is, uh, numerically, is the movement growing? I mean, are more and more people getting involved all the time? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I'm not the statistics person, so maybe Nolan or Kiana have the numbers. As somebody that's just observing the movement, I mean, we are, you know, people in the movement are currently gathering signatures all over the city. The number of people that not only within the city of Atlanta know about this, but really, like you said, nationally and internationally. 
every major city has a coalition of people that is supporting the movement here in Atlanta because something that you hear people say, no cop city here, no cop city anywhere. Exactly. If this, because if this thing gets built in Atlanta, this is a new precedent for every city government in this in the country to develop their own versions of this. Yeah, and we realize that that's the plan. It doesn't. You don't have to be from Atlanta to be very horrified about this. Let me ask you one more question before I go to Belkis. Uh, are you guys under the impression that most of the resistance is on an environmental basis or on the militarization of the police basis? So I think what's, again, really powerful about this movement, if Gannon wants to say something about it, uh, I think it's really that, again, people are coming at this question from every possible angle, right? There are people who are staunch environmentalists who understand that the destruction of a forest is a climate catastrophe problem. There are people who understand that the militarization of police is related to housing. It's related to the economy. There are people who understand that just the fact that the people's voice has been suppressed to this degree is a democratic crisis. And so I think it's what we're really seeing is you have the media that tries to fracture people and say, oh, well, this is an environmental issue or this is a policing issue. Decide which one is it? And I yeah. think what people in the city have said is, no, we understand how all of these issues are interconnected. You know, we've had the Muskogee folks, you know, Miko Shaban has come multiple times with the Muskogee from Oklahoma to say that we are here in solidarity with your struggle because this struggle is also a land back struggle. It's a struggle for indigenous lands. The forest, Walani, is the name that was adopted during this movement because of the Muskogee word for the creek that flows through the forest. It's, it's brown water in Muskogee. So this movement has been in touch with the Muskogee people and their vision for the future and the past. So this movement is really the intersection of all of these different struggles that we've seen over the last decades in this country coming together and saying, we have to be united. And it's only when we're united together in the struggle that can we actually win and change the outcome. I understand. Belkis, I'm very grateful to you, as I said before, for being here. And I want to be sensitive to your own comfort. Um, many of us know the story of your son's death um, to whatever extent. And I think you should be the one who should be allowed to tell that story, uh, should you so wish. Um, not only the story of your son, but your own journey um, to whatever extent you feel moved to share uh, with us. Um, yours, of course, is truly the heart of the matter. Yes, thank you very much. For me, it's an honor to be here. Um, I am here, of course, uh, in a, with the purpose of looking for justice of my son, but not only for my son, because once I, I learn about the people that are involved, I realize there is so many issues and so many problems with, that it have to be with humankind and healing the, the, those uh, broken hearts, you know. Um, I've been, as you know, um, I'm graduated from uh, as a Master of Divinity at, at Northern Baptist Theological Seminary in Lombard, Illinois. And I had in Chicago a specialization on, on urban ministers. But I left. I left the state many years ago. I become mother and I spend a lot of time traveling with uh, the family. And uh, uh, Manuel was growing in a very caring and uh, loving family. So Manuel has this uh, desire to help people since many, many years ago, uh, even when he was a child. So he was giving his toys to people and I was always behind him. No, my darling, let's change for this toy, an old toy, and then he could keep the new toy. <laughs> so Manuel has a, such a precious, precious heart. And when he decided to, to join the movement, 
he found a place to be with and love and caring of all those people. I didn't understand at the beginning, really. I, 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 Manuel, why you have to um, sacrifice your career because he want to be in neuroscience. He graduated in Florida State University as a magna cum laude, excellent student in, in psychology, and he want to do doctoral studies later. But he said, Mom, these people need me. So uh, he, he, he was pl planning to spend a year uh, with them and continue later, you know, his studies. So uh, he was in this uh, public park during the day, nine o'clock in the morning, and he was harassed by this police um, through many, many, they say it was four or five different uh, units of different um, or, or, police organization. Not only it was not only one; it was different. So uh, I understand that they have different calibers on bullets, and he was uh, killed by uh, the. We, we we still don't know because the problem is everything is so covered. But the, the, what I understand from the autopsia that we made, a private autopsia, it was in um, his legs in a meditation position with his hands up like this. And he received uh, 13 bullets. But, and he, in his hands here, they came in here and came out the other side. And uh, the, the other uh, autopsy, the official autopsy reveal, reveal, revealed that he was 57 wounds. They broke bones, they broke, uh, uh, the hands were damaged a lot. Uh, and of course the head, shoulder and his private parts because he was uh, open legs and they destroy his legs with the with the um, power of those machines of those uh, guns very powerful some of them and they they um, went all over the park you know like, um, with fire, everything was fire. I found his um, pants all with many different holes. I gave it to the lawyers and I found his suitcase uh, with two, one <laughs> hole like this and one, another one is smaller. Shoes, I mean, with bullets. So, they went through the old camp um, firing, not only firing into him, but firing to every, everywhere. They collect the bullets, but some of them, you know, they left uh, things that are, he has a big bottle of water like this, you know, very heavy metallic, all destroyed holes everywhere, different sizes. You could see different calibers. So it was horrible. It was criminal. It was, um, I have, Nolan, let's go to you for a moment at Belkis. Uh, uh, yeah, I have uh, cruel, cruel, very cruel. So, yeah, uh, 
the, the, and it was unnecessary because uh, I don't know how to describe uh, the, 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 the sorrow that we found when we arrived in the camp, you know? All, all destroy all his paint material without, yeah, very cruel, very cruel. So they, <clears throat> they we, we have some lawyers that are uh, helping us, but they are not receiving the lawyers. The lawyers, since Manuel is going to be in two days, six months dead six months that he died. So they have been only twice receiving and very briefly the, the lawyers. They gave me some of his um, personal things like uh, uh, books and uh, paints because he was artist too. And they gave me his uh, driver license and his wallet with the with the um, passport. He was a resident. He was a resident because some people ask me if he was illegal. No, Manuel was not illegal. He was a resident. His father gave him a resident. And yeah, we. As a family, it was it was terrible. We are a Christian family. My I'm four generation of Protestant family. Manuel was the fifth generation. Uh, my father was a pastor. And yeah, it was it was very very horrible for us. We never never experienced such a horror in our life. Uh, and uh, as as I am a person that always care for people, I I decided to be part of this group to heal. Uh, we I, I am a therapist too in the massage called Tsiatsu is a Japanese massage. Some of them are having the, the, pre, the, the opportunity to, to receive it. And uh, Manuel had that, he did two, 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 two courses with me uh, on this massage too. I use essence oil I use, uh, um, well, healing therapy. Uh, it's a long, long, long journey that I've been, I've been doing on this. So I decide to join them for healing. I know that the lawyers have a hard work to do, but I try not to get involved in that. I prefer to keep myself in the, in the healing process, in the healing ourselves, healing the community. The community needs to uh, get a new light, a new, a new purpose, you know, to, to stand up against the oppression. For me, I don't like to say fight. I, I respect anybody that say fight, but for me, is a stand up for a, a position to, to, to help people and, and a create atmosphere that, that help all those that are, because everybody is uh, suffering. Uh, everybody have their own, their own journey and their own burdens, you know, their own pain. So my, my purpose is to help those people to, to get up and to have uh, energy, light, and desire to live 
a desire to to create a new environment, a new new uh, war. And Manuel Manuel has this education. All that I'm telling you, Manuel has it because his purpose to be there was to help people, to 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 heal. Uh, I found in his camp, I found uh, essence oil. I found uh, his uh, flute. To he was playing flute. You know the sweet, the one. Uh, I, I, it has a name for because it's the one they use when they are children in the school. You know the like clarinet. Eh, no, no, flute, but the, the small... Um, a recorder? Ah? A recorder? Yeah, that one, the recorder. Uh -huh. And, and uh, I, I could find healing things in his around. Of course, they, they, the police didn't care about those things. Uh, but I found them there. Uh, so he, he, he was there for a good purpose. Uh, why this happened, I don't understand. I, I, I Really, I don't understand. But my faith is so big that I know that if they, if they call me, because I, uh, when Manuel died, they call me. So, I, I will work for them and I'm working for them. I'm, I'm, I'm giving them hope, I'm giving them energy, caring for each other, uniting, uniting them, and that they can see that the world is not so ugly, that even in the adversity, in the bad moment, there is a light. Uh, because God gave us life to go, to continue. So I am doing this. And uh, I had the opportunity to talk to Matt uh, more, Westmoreland. And I hug him and I, and I, I talked to him. I said, ah, it's important that I'm doing this is because I am a mother. I'm a mother and I like to uh, find out what happened. He was very close, of course, but I hope that I gave him something to think about it. So my desire is to help people to grow. <clears throat> uh, I am suffering, yes, I am suffering. I have so much pain, but I have a lot of faith. So the war, God is gonna help me and gonna help us, all of us, in one or another way. And I know it's gonna take time, but it's gonna come because the, the, the justice, it has to come eventually. And, and I really appreciate, I really, really appreciate your, this opportunity that I can talk to you. And you are in my praise and everybody here, of course, and in the movement, because we need to do the best. For, for, for this world that has so much sorrow and, and sadness. Uh, I, I, I wish a, a, a stop of city, the, uh, is my pray furiously <laughs> is a stop of city, not because, only because Manuel died there, it's because it's so, so much, damage that is going to happen to the society. So much damage to poor people. So much suffering is coming if this uh, project 
go go on you know uh and it's only because of money and because of business so thank you mm -hmm. well i just the the moral and spiritual force of your testimony and of your faith um is huge and is a gift uh, i'm sure to everyone who is there but to anyone who hears you tell your story i i want to ask you nolan as a citizen journalist is the assumption that the police and this was not the city police this was the georgia state police is that correct is it the assumption that they went there that day intending to do this in order to have this kind of freezing effect on an, on the protest movement i I think that some people um, are have assumed that and, and and they have, you know, reason to believe so. I think uh, the general sentiment, like Belkis said, this was a multi-department raid. So it was the Atlanta Police Department going in on one side of the forest. It was the DeKalb County Sheriff's Department or the DeKalb County Sheriff's Office going in on uh, another side of the forest. Um, and then the Georgia State Patrol going in on the public park side of the forest where Manny's camp was, uh, all, all being uh, directed by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, who is also the lead investigating entity into the killing of Manny. Um, and, and so, yeah, there, there's what, what is likely to be the case, um, and this is, I think, backed up by a lot of evidence, is that the the police officers, and Belkis has actually talked about this quite a bit with, with me and, and several others, but what's most likely is that uh, these police officers who went into those woods were briefed. They were briefed, uh, and we, we actually have some of the emails uh, going around about how they were being briefed. And they were telling each other things like, these are A, dangerous people. These are B, uh, they said that a lot of the people, and this is true, uh, who are living in the forest or queer people. And on the backside of that, they said, they may throw feces at you. And, and if they throw feces at you, you may contract HIV or AIDS. So you could see in their rhetoric, this homophobic, queer phobic language that they're spreading around. And they're causing fear and they're telling people these are violent domestic terrorists living in this forest so what i i i doubt that personally just from the evidence that i've seen i highly doubt that they went in with a targeted attack meaning to do a political assassination what is more likely is that governor brian kemp and the gbi director who has now stepped down from the gbi in in recent months um they were directing these police officers who, uh, you know, aren't making the higher up decisions. They just told people that to be afraid, that they should be afraid when going in there. And so it's likely that they were startled by something, they came across many, that whatever, and then they began firing. And as they can, uh, during their firing, they actually, one of the police officers was shot. Yeah. By by another policeman. Like, that's that's so let me ask you a question. When Belkis was talking about uh, the lawyers have only been had two meetings or whatever, how is the investigation going? I mean, is is the department, the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, keeping a lid on it and saying this is an internal vest investigation and we won't let anyone else in? The investigation has now been. Uh, According to the GBI, the investigation has is complete, and they turned over all of the evidence in the investigation to a court in Northeast Georgia, and the DA of that court can choose to prosecute officers or prosecute um, GSP if they want to. Um, but we do not, we have not seen publicly the evidence of this investigation because it has now been turned over to a prosecutor. And uh, that that district where they turned over the evidence to is a district that uh, voted for uh, Donald Trump by over 75 percent. 
So that is the current state of the investigation. And it seems like as of right now, outside of the Department of Justice getting involved and investigating this independently, uh, that we will not get any more information from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation until uh, the period of time ends where it's like, where it could be prosecuted. And then we will be able to get that information through the Georgia Open Records Act. But as of right now, we will not be getting any additional information uh, outside of, of course, what uh, the lawyers who are representing uh, Belkis and her family uh, are able to, to discover as they uh, potentially bring, bring a case against a wrongful and Right. One of the things we do know, however, is that the family's autopsy is a different report than the official autopsy report. The official autopsy report did not come out for a very long time. So the family got an autopsy done um, that was after the official autopsy had been done. So it was it was limited in scope. They couldn't see everything. They discovered that there were at least 14 bullet wounds. And then the official autopsy came out a month and a half later, showing that there were 57 bullet wounds. Um, and, and it gave us, gave us a little bit clearer of a picture, like Belkis was talking about with the broken bones and things like that. So both autopsies did show similar things. Right. Complement each other. Okay. And an important detail is in the first, or in this, the official autopsy, um, if I'm correct, Nolan, there was no gunpowder residue found exactly. on Manuel's body, which means that they, the narrative was always, they fired a gun first, they ambushed the police officers, and this was self-defense. The autopsy never had any evidence of, of gunpowder, which would, you know, would lead one to believe that Manny was likely unarmed. And I want to be clear that they also did not uh, show evidence of a gun until three days after, three days after they posted a picture of a handgun laying on the floor of the forest saying, this was Manuel's gun, here it is. They posted it to Twitter. And that was the only evidence at all that they've tried to show that Manuel had a gun in the forest was this picture three days later of a gun laying on the ground. Reverend Jones, one of the things that for me has stood out has been the relative silence of Senators Warnock, Ossoff, um, Stacey Abrams, not to even mm -hmm. mention. And I understand Merrick Garland, even if he was, uh, you know, even if, if if his natural tendency might have been to step in, he can't do it until uh, Georgia has already, you know, weighed in with its prosecutorial um, decision making. But what has been your thought about uh, Warnock, Abrams and Ossoff? Extremely disappointing from Warnock and Ossoff. I have to be very honest in that I never expected Stacey Abrams to say anything about Cop City because she is doing whatever she does to, I guess, remain relevant, try to be neutral right now. Um, I do know that during her last campaign, she made it very clear her support for law enforcement. And a lot of people... I believe, use their support for law enforcement to ignore that an innocent person was murdered, who was unarmed, who was riddled with 57 bullet holes. And the narrative that was originally spun was that Manny shot at a state trooper first. We know that's not true. However, the news media continues to add that in every line at the end of any reporting when it comes to Manny's murder, Senators Ossoff and Warnock have both been contacted, not only people calling them out on social media, but they have been contacted directly through email at their offices. Um, we have gotten responses from their aides that have said, oh, send an email to this other email address and then we get no response. I had an opportunity to participate in an action at Bard College where Reverend Warnock was giving the commencement address and I called him out publicly at Bard in New York because he refuses to say anything to us in Atlanta. He refuses to answer our email. So I went to where he was at Bard College and asked him if he would condemn the murder of Tortuguita 
he refused to even at that time. So what we see from Senators Ossoff and Warnock is that they are playing it very safe. I don't know what the incentive is for them to remain silent on this, but even to this day, they have never given condolences to this family, and that is the very least that they could do. But they seem content right now to go with the flow and lean into the narrative that Mayor Dickens, Governor Kemp, and Attorney General Chris Carr are spinning. Now, environmental uh, activists working on this movement, protesters are continuing to be arrested. Is this correct? And how many are in jail right now? Uh, what's happening? We were reading the other day about an older woman uh, um, uh, levy. Oh, yes. Lorraine Fontana, well into her <laughs> 70s, was arrested for simply showing up at Home Depot with the sign. The people who went to protest Home Depot to let the public know that Home Depot is continuing to fund Cop City were exercising their First Amendment right. They showed up in protest doing what we see people do regularly. And police were there and the police let them know right at that point that Home Depot called them there that Home Depot made sure that they were going to be there. And as Lorraine was arrested, there was really no reason given for her arrest. Um, she we, right she's no longer in course, incarcerated and she is here in Atlanta. She lives here. She's from here. She is a person who would refute their narrative of outside agitators because that's one thing that they love to say. These people are coming here from other places and these are outside agitators. The people in the city of Atlanta want this, but that is not true. Lorraine is one of those people who is actually a pioneer of LGBTQIA plus advocacy here in the city of Atlanta and she's been around for a long time she's been a part of every movement since the civil rights movement and she's a staple in our community and for her to be arrested for simply showing up with the sign to say Home Depot don't fund Cop City it's oh really egregious so how long was she did she remain there overnight she did and then they let her out the next day she was so released the next day what about these other people who are in without bail? Um, Lev, do you know what's going on with these others or Nolan? Or? So uh, we, so they held uh, as many people as they could. So, so far, uh, 46 people have been arrested and charged with domestic terrorism. Um, and each one of them was, uh, if they, several of them were denied bond. The ones who were denied bond were held for 90 days. And in the state of Georgia, the law is that if you don't bring an indictment within that 90 day period, then you then the judge has to grant them bond. So they held them. They held the ones they didn't grant bond for 90 days. Everybody. Um, uh, one more person who was arrested uh, for flyering a neighborhood to tell uh, the neighbors that uh, they live near one of the police officers who killed Manny. One, one person was arrested and they were charged with felony stalking for handing out flyers in a neighborhood. And they, they were just released from jail uh, this past week. And right as of right now, there is one person who is still incarcerated and his name is Victor Puertas. Uh, Victor was incarcerated in the DeKalb County Jail, charged with domestic terrorism after being arrested at a music festival while he was walking to go and check on his dog when he saw that the police were raiding. His dog was in his car. He was heading away from the festival to go check on his dog. And because he was heading away from the festival and running, the police tased him. They uh, tackled him. They put him in a headlock. And one of the pastors uh, in the Faith Coalition, Matthew Johnson, actually had to de-escalate the situation. So, and Matthew often talks about this. He says, um, the, the one, the person with the taser putting this man in a chokehold who had a gun in his holster, we're supposed to believe that he was the person scared for his life? We were the ones who had to de-escalate the situation. This is what Matthew says. So one of the pastors was able to de-escalate the situation. Victor was uh, taken to the DeKalb County Jail. And upon being granted bond at the DeKalb County Jail, uh, while he was uh, going through to, to get out, um, Immigration Customs and Enforcement 
came to the DeKalb County Jail and took him from DeKalb County down to Stewart Detention Center, which is a privately owned uh, detention ICE detention facility in South Georgia. I was able to visit Victor uh, two weeks ago. I got to spend about an hour and a half with him in the ICE facility. And um, he is, uh, you know, having a hard time. Uh, he has been given a red uniform to wear, which is uh, in, in an ICE detention facility. Uh, they give some people blue uniforms and they give some people red uniforms. And red uniforms are meant to denote the people who are, quote unquote, the violent people. And so Victor is wearing a red uniform because he has been charged with domestic terrorism. He's in a private prison down in Stu uh, uh, South Georgia. And um, he's also, although he's having a hard time, he's also in very good spirits because he said so many people from around the country are writing him letters to let him know that they are with him, that they're, they're standing in solidarity with him and that they have his back. And he said that people are sending him books, some really good books, and he gets to read them and then give them to other people who are incarcerated uh, at that center. And he's building community there. However, um, his case is, his immigration case is just getting started. He was on his pathway to citizenship when, um, when this began and they are trying to use it, it. So it seems they're trying to use it as an argument, even though, the, uh, even though his, uh, his case is still just allegations. They're trying to use it as as an opportunity to um, call his citizenship uh, journey into question and potentially deport him once this is all said and done. Does he have a family? His family is um, his family is in um, Peru. It, Peru, you said. So he doesn't have children here or anything like that. Uh, he has a lot of very friends that he would consider to be his family now um, including some in Atlanta but uh, his, the majority of his like uh, given family um, is is in Peru still yeah I'm very grateful to all of you for sharing these stories let me just um, wrap it up by asking you something that you said Nolan you do feel that you're making progress you do feel that you have at least delayed the process correct that there is, I mean, there, there's evidence that the process has been delayed by over a year. Um, and that has been through a number of different tactics uh, that people are, have been deploying. Um, and right now, of course, there is a referendum campaign that is going on where people are trying to collect the signatures to get this put on the November ballot. Um, it is very interesting, however, that uh, the Democratic Party uh, and the mainstream, you know, functions of the Democratic Party, Marianne, as you're very familiar with, um, have have really sounded the alarm about a, a democracy crisis in our country. And I think they're correct about that. Right. Um, it's interesting, however, that uh, Andre Dickens, who is a Democrat and has been named to Joe Biden's um, reelection committee. Oh. Uh, is is uh, already telling the media that he does not believe that the referendum can uh, win unless it cheats. So if he's already, he's doing it, I mean, what it seems like the similar thing is what Donald Trump did uh, leading up to the 2020 election, which was to say, if I lose, it's because it was fraud. It's because this is a sham. And Andre Dickens has already began telling us when I say us, I mean the media, that he believes that if uh, the referendum campaign is able to collect the signatures, which this, the signature requirement is astronomical and already not democratic in the first place, but if they were successful, the only way that they would be successful is to cheat. And perhaps he understands that the bar is set so high that it is very hard. However, they will be calling um, as many signatures into question as they can call into question legally um, in order to dwindle that number down. Well, I, I had mentioned to you guys offline that I did meet him uh, in Atlanta and he was not exactly amenable to, to my questioning. So do you feel that this has probably slowed down some other cities that might be feeling, you know, this might be more, you know, 
more trouble than it's worth? Do you think that the movement has gotten hold enough in the consciousness of the people of this country, the whole issue of the militarization of the police, the whole issue of the, the way uh, Reverend Jones described the project at the very beginning, you really laid out uh, really what a horrifying prospect this is, how much it will increase a sense of division between police and population. Um, and as, as you made so clear with your with your description, create truly create a kind of police state um, infrastructure, uh, which as we know does not belong in the United States. I think that the story has gotten hold. I think that people have heard, are you feeling satisfied? I know this must be a a, a very frustrating process for all of you. And of course, for you at Belkis, an absolutely heartbreaking one. But uh, I assume all of you do feel that uh, the story has gotten out there, that your work is worth it, and that you are sounding an alarm not only for the people of Atlanta, but also for the people of the country. Is that, would, would that be an affirmative for all of you? The only thing I'd say, pass it over to others to respond, is that what I've seen in this movement is that um, the people who are here and fighting, uh, some of them are here because they heard the story and they're, they've stepped up, right? People from our community, people outside of our community, because as you've said several times, Marianne, that this is going to be you know, exported around the country. So it's something that we are all concerned about. However, um, the people who are here are, would also still be doing this if there was never a news story, if there was never, uh, you know, this big public fight, because I, they believe that it is the right thing, that like, there is like, what, what courage does it take to, to um, receive, to like join a fight that you understand that one of the, the most powerful country in the world could charge you with domestic terrorism just for being there and you still do it? It's because you can't not, at least in my opinion, is people feeling called to this forest, people feeling like mm -hmm. they can't not be a part of this struggle. And um, and so I, I both affirm what you're saying and also want to say that I, I really do believe that if nobody ever talked about this outside of the people who were engaging in this struggle, that they would be doing it until the bitter end. That's a very powerful statement. Absolutely, Nolan. Nolan is right. Um, I'm from the neighborhood where Wilani is. I was born and raised there 43 years ago. My granny is 90 years old and she's lived in her home for 50 years, that house where I was born. And until about two months ago, I lived right behind Wilani. I moved because my eight-year-old son could not take hearing the constant gunfire from the existing firing range. So this is very personal for me. I actually left a job where I was employed by a very well-known voting rights organization with ties to Stacey Abrams, but I left that job because they wanted me to only do this halfway to advocate against cop sitting. And there was no way that I was going to do anything halfway for my family, for my granny, for my neighbors, for people who I've known since I was a little girl, or just for the people of unincorporated DeKalb County, there's no way that I can sit down on them or that I can straddle the fence in any way. I had to go in all the way as hard as I could in this fight because I know that it's the right thing. And that's one of the reasons why the Faith Coalition exists so that we can encourage people of faith who are spiritualists, who are leaders in their respective communities to take a moral stand against Cop City because you said it in the beginning, Marianne, it's just evil and we know that and we have a duty to stand up against it. All of you are very, have very moving things to say and I thank you. Lev, do you have any final words you'd like to say? Yeah, sure. I think a lot has been said and a lot can be said about this movement and about the struggle. To sort of answer the question that you posed, you know, to what extent has this movement been successful? I think that it's really unique. Like the fact that this is happening in Atlanta is just this confluence of, uh, it, you know, it's, it's the home place of the civil rights. It's the city that is most surveilled. It is a city that is very blue in a very red state. It is the most forested city in the, in the country. And so 
the fact that there is even a city in America that still has a forest with a tree that's 300 years old that people have called the mother tree, you know, like these things, like, you know, I was drawn into this movement as, as a filmmaker because these images that I'm talking about, they're almost impossible to convey in like these Zoom conversations or in the news media, like the transformative power of this movement of being in that forest. There's a reason why they shut down the forest saying that it's unsafe to be there because of booby traps. That forest, those trees are very powerful. And this movement taking its strength from this land, which, you know, this forest was a prison. It was a slave plantation. And before that, it was Muscogee land. And so this is not a pristine, you know, redwoods. This is a piece of land that is very wounded, very, uh, very distraught, and it's healing. And the people that come into this movement, a lot of them are also people who are wounded, who also need healing, like all of us do. And so when people come into this movement and they find that healing in the forest amongst the movement, it is a very powerful transformative experience. And that experience is terrifying to the state because it is through that experience that we're able to overcome divisions that they've tried to enforce on the American people for centuries. This is a mythological struggle. This is, this is that's why I say, and I feel like a lot of people in the movement really feel like this is you know, a century defining struggle, you know, and the people who not only in Atlanta that participated in this, it's people who the outside agitators that have been called to come support the struggle, they are also transformed and they return back to their communities in their own cities, in their own rural towns. And they are then taking the things they learned from this movement and they're educating people in their own towns, not only to support the movement here, but to support movements that are similar in their own cities. So this movement is not only a threat to Atlanta, it is really a threat to most major cities that wanna build cop cities, that wanna build jails, that wanna, for example, Norfolk Southern, the train derailment that happened in Ohio and East Palestine, right? Be the, the police arrested a journalist very early on. When Aaron Brockovich came, they preemptively said, be weary of the domestic terrorists that are environmental domestic terrorists that are going to show up. The CEO of Norfolk Southern lives in the neighborhood that Keanu was talking about in the very beginning, in Buckhead. And Norfolk Southern is a huge contributor to Cop City. So these things are not just isolated to Atlanta. These things are international, national. And so this struggle people have understood is not just about what's happening here, but it's captivated people's imaginations and people's hearts really because people in the city have decided to say that, yes, we all have differences. We have differences in our tactics. We have differences in our ideological perspectives. We have differences in privilege, but all of these things do not prevent us from finding a way to work together and stand up for our rights. And the state is terrified of that. That is why they're levying these domestic terrorism charges that they know probably won't stick, but it's a fear tactic. It's, it's there to make you be afraid to join. Like Nolan said, they're terrified that people are still fighting even with those threats. And so, you know, I think that Manny's murder was heartbreaking for everyone in the city. And it did not demotivate people from fighting. It only encouraged people to fight more because they did not want Manny's death to be in vain, you know? And Belkis spread Manny's ashes through the forest. That's what I'm saying, that the images, the things that are being created in this movement are just so powerful. Belkis did a ceremony. And the only reason there weren't helicopters circling overhead was because of the porn. And she spread Manny's ashes all through the forest and at the memorial site, which was then demolished when they decided to lock down the forest and kick everybody out. So this is this is truly like a, a spiritual battle that's being waged in this forest. Well, some people will make fun of me for saying this, but it really is like the movie Avatar. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, it's years and years of uh, attacking the poor community. 
uh, the black community, the, the indigenous communities, the queer communities, and all minorities are being are, are being suffering so much, so much. And 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 why too? Not only there is not only uh, uh, minorities, it's white people too that are suffering and like Lorraine is white, pure white, and and she's she has been suffering and so many other people in Atlanta that are uh, uh, carrying this sorrow from from centuries, you know? You know, Winston Churchill said that Americans can always be counted on to do the right thing after we have exhausted every other option. This is not only mythical in the ways that you were saying, Lev, but also very much in keeping with some of the greatest social justice struggles in our history. And I, I think we should all remind one another that ultimately all of those uh, movements did prevail, whether it was abolition or women's suffrage or the civil rights movement or the original labor movement. And I think that what you were doing, while heartbreaking and difficult, is part of a larger revolutionary struggle going on in this country at this time. And um, over policing, militarization of police, demonization of environmental protesters, destruction of the earth, and all those intersectional ways that Liv was talking about. I just want to thank all of you on behalf of I know everyone who is listening for being on the front lines the way you are. And Belkis, I just, as a mother and as a woman, I just admire you so greatly. And uh, I hope you realize that for everyone who is watching, the moral force of your presence and that you were taking your own grief and turning it into medicine. And I, I can see what a magnetic power your faith has on all of the people on this call. And I can imagine all the people in this movement. So um, just being in the presence of all of your testimony has been very profound. And uh, there's great moral and spiritual force and the heartbroken mother, um, talk about mythical. Um, there's nothing like the prayers of a heartbroken mother. And I believe that your prayers are heard. I believe that your prayers are answered. And I just want to say, I share with you her, your faith. Uh, yeah. And I, I'm, not, I'm sure that Manuel will be proud of me. He is proud of you. He yeah, sure, is I'm so sure. proud of you. And uh, our faith is not only that the struggle will prevail, but uh, one day you will be rejoined with your son in great joy and i'm sure we he's have a very we have a very nice relation mother and son and with the family manuel was an exceptional person it was very cruel what happened and everybody here that knows everybody that knows him has that you know it's very hard uh the, to 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 overcome the sadness because he was so so light or cheering, smiling, and uh, yeah, it's very, but I'm sure that whatever he is, he's looking at me and saying, Mom, I'm proud of you, because he was telling me sometimes, he was very, very nice to me. And, uh, and then thank you, and I'm very happy that you could join us and have this conversation. And I keep you in my prayers. I listen to you. I follow you. Thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and I bless you. And I hope you can do something good for this country. That is, that is uh, terrible what is happening. Uh, all those leaders that are crumbling and are, I hope uh, you put the light in somewhere uh, to bright the life of so many people because they need you. They need people that are working from the heart. And that's what we are doing here. And in this movement, nobody's gonna destroy it because it's from the heart. We are working from the heart. Our energy is coming from love, from caring. Nobody can destroy that, nobody. And those people that are doing bad to us, they know, they know, but their heart is so uh, covered for uh, greedy and corruption and 
power and they don't know what they are doing for themselves and for the future of the families because their families are going to suffer too. Not only us, but their families, their future, their grandchildren, the great grandchildren. So that's what Manuel was saying, you know, looking in the future and those people, we have to work for them. And that's what I'm continue, I will continue, and I will stand up everywhere that I can to, to say the truth, to say the truth, no, 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 not lie, because those people are lying all the time, are destroying confidence, destroying people. But we are here to heal, to heal and to correct what is has to be correct in our heart to continue. We have to continue. And Manuel says the best way to defeat the police is to be happy. He didn't use defeat. He, I put defeat. The, is to be happy. And that's what I, to be happy, you need to have a courage because it's very hard to be happy in this situation. But I, I will, those words are here. The best way to defeat the police is to be happy. And I will be happy. And I will be strong to help those people that need me every day. God bless you, ma'am. You, you are quite a gift to all of us, truly. Truly, I bow before your courage and your spirit and your uh, the profound blessing and that you have turned your heartbreak into a gift for so many. And uh, he's watching and you will see him again. And I absolutely know, and I think we all do, that his first words will be how proud he is. <laughs> yes, well, yes. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I, I wish you the best of luck on your struggle. Not that it is luck, but I... I, I wish you accompanied by angels, which obviously you are. And um, please know, continue to know. And I, I think with this Firelight Chat, uh, you gained a few more people who understand uh, even more deeply what you are doing. And I wish you all the very best. Thank you so, so much for telling us your story here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne.